Toronto is a championship city. We are champions in business, education, art, culture, science, and sport. Professional sports is one of the reasons why Toronto is a world-class city. The powerhouse of the sports industry in Canada is Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. The company's vast holdings include the Air Canada Centre, the Toronto Raptors, the Toronto FC, and our beloved Toronto Maple Leafs, one of the oldest and most valuable sports franchises in the world. I've had the great honour of working with my good friend Mr. Chris Rudge here on the bid process for the 2015 Pan American Games. We travelled the world together selling the virtues of sport in the city of Toronto. In that process, I learned that sport is much greater than a puck and a net or a ball and a hoop. Sport brings people together. Sport makes communities healthy. Sport ignites economic development and inspires our youth. In Canada, professional sport is much more than a game that you watch. In 1963, Clarence Campbell, the then president of the NHL, spoke at this very podium at the Empire Club. At the time, there were only six teams in the league, and he said, hockey fans in Canada are participants. They are not spectators. They are fundamentally participants. You go to a hockey game in Canada and watch the reaction of the crowd, and many of them need a rest when they get home. Sport is also a catalyst for change. Urban life changes when our teams succeed. Hotels are built. Restaurants emerge. International conventions are booked. And urban residential communities are, in are intensified. Mr. Tim Laiwicki brings a fresh beginning to the city of Toronto. As of this past summer, he is the new president and CEO of the Maple Leaf Sports and, en of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment and one of the most highly regarded leaders in the sports industry. Mr. Laiwicki was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and at the age of 24, he became the youngest general manager in professional sports. Mr. Laiwicki was brought out to Los Angeles to become the president of the Los Angeles Kings. In 2001, he became the president and CEO of the team's parent company, AEG. The company's properties that include the LA Kings, Los Angeles Galaxy, and a significant stake in the LA Lakers. While at AEG, Mr. Laiwicki was responsible for the overall development of the Staples Center and LA Live, a four million square foot, $2.5 billion sports, residential, and entertainment district. Mr. Laiwicki has received countless hours for his business acumen including being ranked fifth in the Sports Business Journal's Most Influential People in Sports, and for his tireless community efforts in the cities that he's lived in. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the man whose job it is to decide if the parade will go down Young Street or Bay Street, <laughs> Mr. Laiwicki. Noble had to get that little parade coming in there, didn't you? I want you to know uh, that although I'm very honored to be here, 110 years worth of history, I do think it's rather ironic that uh, after talking about the 100-year history of the Leafs and taking the pictures down that uh, you have invited me to come here. So I appreciate the Empire Club and your, your ability to understand my commitment to history and tradition, which I do get no matter what I said about those pictures uh, and the Leafs' history and tradition. We are honored to be here today and be amongst some of the great leaders uh, that have been before this group. Uh, to look at your speakers and the roster here, and to understand the great people that have stood before you. It is a, a real honor and uh, something we're very proud of. Uh, I, I must tell you, after watching the video, though, I'm uh, very apologetic about the land grab from the United States. Uh, so if, if there's something I could do to help you get it back, let me know. <laughs> I feel very bad about that, and I apologize. <clears throat> uh, you know, when I was with the Kings, ironically, we talked a lot about Canada. In fact, back in the 1960s, when the great Jack Kent Cooke, who also owned the Washington Redskins, uh, when he bought the Kings and he bought the Lakers, and he, he created an expansion franchise in the National Hockey League out in Los Angeles, 
People came to him and said, oh, you're going to do extremely well out there. There's almost a million Canadians that live in and around Southern California. And at the end of the first season, they did not draw very well. And by the way, they had the worst uniforms in the history of the National Hockey League. They all look like grapes or, or lemons out there. And they asked Jack Kent Cook, well, what'd you think about your first year and you know, the support that you have derived in Los Angeles? And all those Canadians that live here, and he said, I have figured out that Canadians move to LA because they hate hockey. <laughs> now, uh, coming from Los Angeles to the, the Cathedral of Hockey, and, and some uh, will argue that there are other places more important, other places more historic, and other places that are more ingrained in the sport of hockey, they are wrong. Toronto is the heart and the soul of the great game of hockey, and we at the Leafs clearly understand once and for all, we must become the Yankees of baseball or the Cowboys of football. So too must the Leafs become the greatest hockey team in the history of the National Hockey League. And so, <clears throat> so let me, before I talk about how we get there, uh, let me tell you a couple of quick things about uh, when we were, my family and I were considering the move. Uh, when, when I left AEG and I was uh, fortunate enough to get a call from uh, George Cope and Nadir, the Rogers Bell folks and Larry Tannenbaum and, and they brought me in for a couple of interviews. Uh, my second time in, we decided my family would join me and they'd come in a couple of days after I'd been here. So they called the first day I was here and they said, how's it going? And I said, oh, things are good. I really love the city. And what they didn't know is it was an ice storm and it was like miserable, to be honest with you. And this is like April, and I'm like, what the heck is going on here? <clears throat> and I tell my wife, oh, what a lovely city, honey. You're gonna love it here. And the second day, the ice storm gets more vicious, and, and it's like, oh my God, if they come here, I don't think they're gonna stay. And the third day, they finally get there, and it's still an ice storm, and it's kind of miserable, and I'm like, this is so unusual. It's been so nice here the last two days. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I kind of think they might be buying it until we walk into the hotel room and my overcoat I've been wearing the last two days is standing in the corner by itself because it's still frozen. <laughs> and that's about when they looked at me and said, are you sure about this? Amazingly, despite the ice storm, what we've realized is there is a reason in North America that your city and this great community is voted and considered to be the most uh, tremendous place, the number one quality of life and all of North America is Toronto. Uh, you, absolutely. <clears throat> and thank God we haven't had any more ice storms since my family moved here. Uh, I will also tell you that uh, as I was saying yes, we went into that infamous seventh game against Boston. And uh, despite the ice storm, despite uh, giving up the, the four goals, despite that seventh game, I couldn't be more excited to be here, couldn't be more excited about this journey and where we're headed together. And I will say it front and center with the cameras rolling, could not be more excited about the parade route and we're gonna throw you one, I promise. <laughs> so what, what do you do when, when you came from Los Angeles where we had the, the honor and fortune of being part of the Lakers, great runs of championships and you were taught by Jerry West and Phil Jackson and Dr. Jerry Buss. Uh, when you had a chance two years ago to win, to me, the hardest trophy in all of sports to win, in all due respect to the Grey Cup, Chris, the Stanley Cup uh, with the LA Kings. And when you were fortunate enough to watch maybe the greatest soccer player from a brand standpoint, famous soccer player on the face of the earth, David Beckham, win back-to-back -back championships with the Galaxy. When you come here and you begin to look at the task at hand, there are many people that say, well, why would you leave that to inherit this? And what I tell them is, we inherit this to become that. And that's exactly the task at hand. How do we take the culture? How do we take the tradition? And how do we take the history that was created in Los Angeles with those winning programs and help ingrain them upon the teams here? Now, every team sits around and talks about winning. Trust me, this is not a lack of desire or intelligence. There is not a team in professional sports anywhere in North America, anywhere in the world for that matter, that doesn't want to win a championship. 
So what is it that suddenly we can inspire and introduce to our culture that gives us an opportunity to change the mentality here? Well, I will tell you that I do believe that winning is directly associated with the environment in which we as an organization create for our players. I believe there is a direct correlation between the accountability that we demand out of our players, our team, and our coaches, and the expectations that they believe they owe back to us, and in turn, what we deliver back to you. And what we needed is we needed accountability. Now, with all of the teams, one of the amazing things is we never talked about winning championships. And I asked a couple of the GMs, one that's no longer with us, why didn't we do that? And they said, well, you know, we don't want to create those expectations. And I heard, especially on the basketball side, well, the great players, they won't stay here. Look at the guys we've had. Look at Carter, look at Bosch, look at all these guys, they all left. And the players that we want to get here won't come here because it's Toronto. And I'm thinking, that's interesting. So you look at that culture, you look at those expectations, you look at the desire to create accountability, and we went out and we talked to the best players I knew in the NBA that were elsewhere and said, tell me what you think of Toronto, tell me what you think of the Raptors, and do you think it's going to be hard for us to keep great players or attract great players? And we talked to a half dozen guys that are in the league and a few guys like Shaquille and Magic and Charles Barkley that aren't in the league anymore. And to a person, every one of them came back and said, the best place to play in the NBA. My favorite city outside of where I played. I love going to Toronto. And they told me all the reasons they like coming here, some of which I didn't want to hear, but most were really good reasons. <laughs> and what was very clear was, to me, very evident, two things. First and foremost, we do not have an image problem here, ladies and gentlemen. This is a great place to live. This is a great place to be a part of a sports organization. This is a great place to win championships. Be proud of your city. I'm blown away by not just the quality of life, by the people and the friendliness of this community, but the, the dynamic nature. Do you know that if you take the second, third, and fourth fastest growing city in North America, New York, LA, and Mexico City, and add up all their construction, that construction combined does not equal what is going on in our great city of Toronto. When you talk about quality of life, when you talk about a place you want to bring your family up, let me tell you something. I learned very quickly, players want to come here, players want to stay here. Look at Clarkson and Bolin with the Leafs. They want to be a part of this city and this community. And what we had was excuses. We found reasons why we would not succeed. And that's why they didn't want to talk about championships. They didn't want the pressure. They didn't want those expectations. Well, now we're in the expectation business. That's what we do for a living. That's why we ask you for as much as we ask you for, and we know it's a lot. You buy tickets to ultimately come watch us win. That's your end game and your hope. That's what you expect out of us. We, in turn, must make that not only a policy and part of our culture, but we must have accountability with the players to make them understand now we're here to win championships. We're here to win trophies, and we'll do whatever it takes in order to get there, and we're going to put it front and center and let everyone know from now on out, championships is not a nasty word. It is not an excuse. It is not an unreasonable expectation. It is what we live for, what we think about, and what we work for each and every day from now on out. So how do we get there? To, for some of these teams, it is a quick journey, and for others, it will be a, a patient journey. Uh, the Leafs are close. Uh, Dave Nonis has done a phenomenal job with this club, and we had, I thought, and still do think, the best offseason of any team in the National Hockey League. Can you imagine now, as you sit back and look at the success that we've had in the early part of the year, including for most of the month of October, the best record in 20 years, and you look at who got us there. And the guys that were the core of that success, despite the injuries we had, and we had more injuries to our key guys than almost any team in the National Hockey League our first month. But if you look at who got us here, it was Raymond, it was Bolin, it was Bernier. Three kids that our GM went out and picked up this summer, and now Clarkson's back. And I think the reason we created this environment this team now has, the commitment that this team has towards doing something special, 
No disrespect to the history and tradition of the 100 years of the Toronto Maple Leafs or any of the great players that have put on that jersey. But these players know now it's time to put their pictures up on a wall. It's time for us to hang Stanley Cup banners. It's time for us to honor them and the tradition that we can now create for this generation. And Bolin, Clarkson, Bernier, Raymond, those guys are going to be at the heart and soul of understanding that. They've won championships. Bolin has two rings. Bernier has a ring. Clarkson was in the Stanley Cup Finals two years ago. They are going to help teach us, from a culture standpoint, what it is we need to do to create those expectations, create those accountabilities, and make sure that we deliver to you a team that's capable of winning the Stanley Cup each and every year. Dave Nonis has done a great job. We have work to do. Injuries and luck play a part of it. But I will tell you, this is an organization that has a chance of being great. It's one of the younger teams in the NHL, and we're going to continue to do whatever we need to do to fill in the pieces and continue to add to the puzzle to win you a cup. The Leafs are on their road and on their way. They, they get the expectations. We understand the accountability, and we're prepared to look you in the eye and tell you, in short order, Unless we win a cup, we did not have a good successful year, and we're not far away from being able to look you in the eye and create that accountability going forward. The Raptors are different. We live in a, in a system where we have a, a salary cap and a luxury tax. We live in a system where the entry into the NBA is mostly done through two major vehicles, and that is drafting and drafting well and trading. And the unique beast in the NBA is you can't trade a player for another player unless their salaries are within 90% of one another. You, you can't offload salaries. You have to find equal value. And so the NBA is very difficult to go build on the fly, and you will not build a team quickly. You either get very fortunate and you don't have a good year like San Antonio when they were able to get the key nucleus of that team by having a bad year and getting a great draft pick, and they built that team with those draft picks. You look at Oklahoma City. You, you feel for the fans in Seattle because they were not very good in Seattle and they were able to go out and draft what I think today is the centerpiece on one of the best players in all of the NBA and Kevin Durant. You need to be in a position where you get lucky with the draft. You need to draft extremely well. You need to enter into good contracts that give you the room to ultimately fill in the rest of your roster. To be honest with you, we haven't done that here. And I'm not blaming anybody. Now the blame's on us. This is our team, no one else's team. These are our decisions, no one else's decisions. We inherit the good and the bad. And what we have now is an organization that in the past, look, I sat in the draft room this year. If there was ever a team that wanted a draft pick this year, it would have been the Toronto Raptors, especially with the Canadian kids that came out this year into the NBA through the draft. And we had no draft picks, none. Now, think about this for a second. We haven't been in the playoffs in forever. We, we weren't in the playoffs this past year, and we had zero draft picks. That is hard to do. That is really good work right there. <laughs> and yet I sat there and I watched our GM and Masai's staff that he put together, one of the youngest management teams in all of professional sports and certainly in the NBA, and they never gave up that night. They tried 20 different scenarios to, to try to buy into the draft, trade into the draft, and get a pick. And they had six key kids that they wanted to get all the way through the end of that second round. And they never gave up. And I felt terrible. I walked out of there saying, we just sent a bunch of new, young, exciting, brilliant executives into a war. And they had a BB gun, and everyone else had nuclear bombs. And yet, the next morning, they all came in and said, don't worry. This is where we turn it around. That is our low point. That's the worst you'll ever see. And it taught us a very valuable lesson. We'll never let that happen to this organization again. And we build from there. And from that day on, I've never seen them make an excuse. I've never seen them look back and complain. I've never seen them point fingers. Masai and his team have done one thing and one thing only. How do we win a championship? Now, it's going to take a little time with the Raptors. But I predict, and I know the cameras are rolling. I always, this is where I always get into trouble. I, by the way, we, when I came, we had zero media guys. Now we have like five media guys. They just run around and tell me what I cannot say. <laughs> I'm not the guy that they, they don't sit there and say, here's your speech today. They give me a piece of paper saying, don't say any of these 10 things, whatever you do. <laughs> and I say nine out of the 10 usually. 
you're going to be surprised by this Raptors team. I think this will be a classic case. We did not change a lot with this team. We have some good bench players, including, I'm not allowed to call him Psycho, Psycho, who is going to come off the bench and give us energy that we need. But you will see a different team with a different culture, with a different spirit. And we're all on the same page. The coach, his assistant coaches, the front office, the players, management, we are all on the same page. We know exactly where we're going. We communicate brilliantly on a daily basis about what lies before us. And these players are ticked off that people aren't looking at them. Ticked off that they talk more about our mascot and his Achilles heel and his rupture of the tendon than they do about our basketball team. And they're out to prove something this year. I'd go buy tickets. You're going to enjoy this club. They're going to try hard every night. And I think we're going to shock a lot of people. Our soccer team is absolutely in complete disarray. And so, <laughs> as an optimist who gets up every day saying, that ice storm was nothing, honey, <laughs> the soccer team needs work. But the funny thing is, in Major League Soccer, we have a wonderful rule called the designated player rule. And I help write it, so I know it well. And we were able to get David Beckham and Landon Donovan and Robbie Keane in Los Angeles to win championships there using that rule. We know how to use this rule, folks. I promise you, we're really good at using this rule. And in that scenario, when you take the young nucleus that they've built, and you're gonna see about 15 of these young kids that have grown up here in the past year come back to be the nucleus. Seven of them, by the way, that have come through either our academy or, or come through Canada. And we're gonna take that nucleus and we're gonna add to it these three DPs and we have about a third of our salary budget still left to add two or three other key veteran MLS players. The team we turn the quickest will be TFC and we'll turn them next year. Mark it down, write it down, film it. Go ahead and yell at me next year. Talk to me about the ice storms. We're gonna turn TFC around and we're gonna make the playoffs next year. We know where we're headed. We know how to get there. We have been given the resources of this ownership group and we will get to the right place. So they, they asked me, <laughs> before I take questions, they asked me two things. They said, what are the lessons you've learned and, and what do you not do in Toronto? So uh, don't come do a recruiting trip with your family in the middle of your ice storm in April was a really good lesson. Uh, do not ride the subway back to my home after a terrible Leafs loss because you're <laughs> trapped like a rat in the corner <laughs> and they get really mad at you. Uh, but I, I don't need security. And make sure you have breakfast with the mayor and you don't go to dinner with the mayor. That's the other thing I learned. <laughs> so let me tell you what I, I see in our future. I love your mayor. He's cute. He's, he's like Tommy boy. So he's, he's a good guy. So what, 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 we, what we need to do for this city. Um, we're going to get more aggressive here. This economy matters. We are an organization that at the end of the day can move the needle here. And you're all business people, so you know this. We're gonna get in the event business first and foremost. We have a great staff. I was very impressed by the management team at Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment. You heard about the people I let go. Well, let me tell you, there are a lot more people we didn't let go. And believe me, I was not afraid of firing people. We came in and cleaned house. But the core nucleus of this organization is brilliant. They're very good. And this management team is going to get us in the event business. We just landed the NBA All-Star Game for 2016. Now, folks, let me, <laughs> let me tell you something. Those that say the greatest players in the NBA don't want to come to Toronto, BS, they're coming to Toronto in February of 2016, right in the middle of our winter, and they're looking forward to it. And when we announced that, we announced a new partnership with Drake. And we created 2.2 billion impressions in about 48 hours for Toronto, the Raptors, and Drake with that announcement. Think about that, 2.2 billion impressions. That's what we can do to move the needle for this community. We are, the introduction was right, Noble was exactly right. We are your conscience. We are what gets you excited and what makes you passionate about this community. We're what makes you smile in the morning and go to bed dreaming of parades at night. We get that. And we're going to do a better job of that because we can move the psyche of this town and this region like nothing else. From an economy, economic impact standpoint, our job is to go out there and take risk. And we're going to do that now. 
That's not the first All-Star game we're going to get. We're going to get an NHL All-Star game and an NHL draft here in the near future. But we want to bid on more things that ultimately fill up rooms, fill up restaurants, fill up retail, and help move the economy here. That's our job, and we're going to be very aggressive about it. But we also know we need to win. We need to go out now and make sure that his introduction was correct, which is Toronto is a city of champions. It is, but we're not it yet. He is, but we're not. We understand the mantle, the pressure, the expectations, and the impact of what we can do if we can win for you. And we think about it every day, we think about it every night when we go to bed, and we think about it every morning when we get back up and come into work. And that is the cultural change that is occurring at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. How can I answer your questions? There's a the number of microphones roaming around. Feel free to raise your hand and someone will come up, with, come up to you with a mic. This is awesome. I could get out of here without any questions. <laughs> I think I'm unscathed so far and didn't have any bad moments yet. Especially while Chris is here, are the Argos going to come and join you at uh, BMO Field? Um, so, you know, the, the, the great couple of myths on BMO Field is we don't own BMO Field, you do. So it is owned by the city and it is owned by the taxpayers. And so the taxpayers have come here and, and through the city, they've asked us, can you ultimately make it work for the Argos? And so we're looking at it. It doesn't mean yes, it doesn't mean no. We don't have a deal, he'll tell you that. Chris and us know each other well. I'm a big fan of what they've accomplished. In particular, I think the Grey Cup was great for the economy in Toronto, and I think it moves the needle. So we're fans of the Argos, we're fans of David, we're fans of Chris. But that said, it is a process, it is research, it's expensive, and we have to figure out, can we pay for it? I know this much, 17 of the 19 games this year, if you're a TFC fan, you sat in the rain. We got to put an end to that. It's time to put a roof on BMO Field. So we have a lot of things we need to do there, including getting you a world-class player or two. The Argos are a part of a conversation, not a decision that's been made. And before we make that decision, it will be vented with the proper people, including the TFC season ticket holders, so we make sure we do not rain on their parade. What are the odds of an NFL franchise coming here in the next decade? Pretty good. <laughs> that was one of those 10 things he said, don't talk about this. <laughs> That's so good I made that such a brief answer. That's so unlike me. What else? Don't be shy. You could ask about free. We see we signed our free agents for the most part, so people are happy. We got Kessel. It's amazing what 64 million will do for you. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, the jersey. Um, so I did what you told me to do. $20 <laughs> will get you very far in this city. So on, on Saturday night, the Leafs were playing the Penguins, uh, a perennial champion in the Eastern Conference. I forget if it was the second period or third period, but came, the, came back to the, um, to the game, and Jim Houston said it feels like a library in here. And I've heard you talk about this before, but how do you make the ACC a challenging place to play for other NHL teams, because um, we all know it's embarrassing in there when you're watching on TV, watching the arena. Yeah, uh, it's a great question, and actually the players bring this up. And so they've, they, they uh, Shannon, who amongst other responsibilities in the organization has game ops underneath her, she, she's had a, a rough couple of weeks because I go back to her saying the players think the environment really and then I say a word that I'm not allowed to say here. And so we, it, it's an interesting thing with Leafs games. We're 100 years old. We've had generation upon generation pass the tickets down. We have a lot of corporate culture and a lot of corporate clients. And so what we don't have is a lot of fresh blood every night. And so one of the debates we're going through internally, and I'm driving some of our people crazy, including some shifting in the audience now, <laughs> is maybe it's time we free up a larger block of tickets to allow people to come in on a per night basis and bring some fresh noise into that building. Because there's a lot of people, especially in that lower level, you can't teach them to cheer. 
It, you just can't. It, it is what it is. We have trouble getting them in their seats at the beginning of each and every period. And so we need some work there. It's not just about the music we play. It's not just about the skits or the timeouts or what's going on in our video board. It's not even about a new video board, which we're thinking of now. I think we had to think about the culture of a Leafs experience and bringing fresh blood in there. Now, we spend a lot of money. We make a lot of money, but we spend a lot of money. And, and we have to find the balance between 500 seats and giving up the revenue of 500 season tickets for 500 fans that are true die in the wool blue collar fans that could get in for not a lot of money. But if we do not do that, if we don't create some new blood here, 20, 50 years from now, as our community evolves into a truly international city, let us not forget the majority of people that live in Toronto today did not come from Toronto and they don't understand hockey. And unless we begin to teach them about hockey, not just at a grassroots level, but the experience of coming to the shrine of hockey, we not only have an environment issue, we have a fan base issue and we gotta go solve it. So yours is a good point. What about expanding the, the size of the arena into a second team? You've worked with uh, two team cities before. Is that an option, is that on the table? So are, I, I assume you're referring to the NHL, not the NBA or? Yeah, NHL. NHL. Um, I, I think we as a league have to make sure, this is not really geared towards how I feel about Toronto. I felt the same way looking at expansion when I was in LA as the governor there. I think we have to get back to the Pacific Northwest we have to. Uh, I think with a new arena in Seattle, we have a unique once in a lifetime opportunity to put hockey back into the Seattle Portland marketplace. And I think we have to make a commitment towards that. So I, for one, speaking now on behalf of Larry Tannenbaum, our governor here, we'd like to see that. That's important. There's a new building being built in Quebec. Uh, they're way ahead of anyone else as to considerations because we took a team from Quebec. And like we did in Winnipeg, where we felt an obligation to return a team to Winnipeg, and they're doing an unbelievable job of supporting it. Do we not as a league also own Quebec another start if they get a new arena and they take the risk, the spec risk of, of privately building a new arena there, which they're doing. I think we owe Quebec another shot. So long before we talk about a second team in the Toronto marketplace, uh, I think we have to be observant of how we as a league need to properly expand our fan base, our eyeballs, our distribution network, and continue to grow the sport in places where we haven't been or we need to go back to. And I believe that there's other cities, Kansas City and Las Vegas are talked about as well. These are all cities that have gone out and already built new arenas. You could talk about building a new arena and getting a team, but the reality is there are already cities way in line. Kansas City's arena has been open for five years and they have an NHL hockey locker room already built there and the NHL's done well when they played the games there. Seattle, Kansas City, Quebec, Las Vegas and the new arena under construction there, they're way ahead of any conversation that anyone else ought to be having in this community because economically, I could tell you flat out, there's not a second team coming to Toronto anytime in the near future. There are other cities that deserve it, that have to be front and center, and we need to address as a league first. And by the way, we're gonna win. Hi Tim, my name is Shad Dales, I'm from TSN Radio. I just wanna first off say, Awesome job here today. Love what you had to say. Um, you know, you touch on the, the market of Toronto. You know, we're the fastest growing market in North America right now, and there's so much to offer. Another thing you said, you talked to some key players in the NBA that said Toronto is a key place that they'd like to play. You, you think five years from now, you obviously want to win championships, and that's how you're gauged. Do you see yourself kind of like what the Lakers signing Kobe Bryant and Shaquille leaving Orlando and going to LA. Do you see key NBA stars within three to five years coming to Toronto and becoming eventually Raptors? Uh, yes, first, we may have a few already. So this year I think is gonna be telling for kids like Jonas who, I think this kid has a chance to be an all-star. He, he could be that good. Uh, I think if you see DeMar, you see Rudy, these are two kids that people are beginning to mention that based on the attitude and the way they played in the preseason, they could have great years. So within our midst, we may surprise you. Uh, Kobe was drafted. Uh, Jerry West did an unbelievable job. It wasn't even our draft pick. We got it from Charlotte. How to this day, I will still never be able to figure out, but we did. 
I think we have a president in GM that has that ability in him. If you look at the trade he made, and I said I wouldn't go backwards and talk bad about anybody, but we did an unbelievable job of going forward by making a trade and getting rid of a player. And so it changed the attitude of this organization and our salary cap going forward. Masai's the kind of guy that will catch lightning in a bottle. I, I believe it. He, he had 57 wins, the most in the history of the Denver Nuggets last year there as the NBA Executive of the Year, based on that trade he made with the New York Knicks when he got rid of Carmelo Anthony. And so I think he's capable of doing a trade that will have an all-star kind of player magnitude for us one day. And we just not, we need to get to the right place with our cap in order to pull that off. And then finally, we need, as Masai said, I don't care if we're first or 24th in the NBA draft. One, don't trade the pick, there's a big idea. And secondly, just pick well, do your homework. The, the, the best, some of the best players in the NBA were not drafted first. If everyone, you know, we, I hear these people that come up to me and say, you ought to tank. And I'm like, one, you do not build a culture of winning for any of the organizations by going to these 14, 13 young men and say, we're gonna tank this year and we don't care about you. We're not gonna do that. Secondly, I think you gotta understand in the NBA, the team that has the worst record only has a 25% chance of getting the first pick. We're not gonna play the lottery, we're not gonna play ping pongs. We'll go to Vegas for a weekend if we wanna gamble, we're not gonna do it with the future of your franchise. This is about winning, because I know one thing, free agents, when Shaquille O'Neal came to LA, it was because he thought he could win a championship. Steve Nash came to LA because he thought he could win a championship. That didn't turn out so well, but we got two more years to see what happens, and I hope Steve does it, he deserves it. We need to win here. That's what brings players. We know the city's great. They're bringing all the best players in 2016. If we win and we build a culture of winning, players are going to want to come here. Time for one last question over there. Oh, good. From the, the I want to hear from you guys. You're our future season ticket holders. <laughs> uh, thank you for taking my question. I just wanted to ask about the identity of the Raptors as far as colors are concerned. The Argos and Blue Jays and the Maple Leafs are blue, but the, the Toronto FC and the Raptors are red. How do you make the Raptors recognizable in the NBA? Everybody wears Maple Leafs jerseys and everything, but I don't see too much of Raptors jerseys and hats. Uh, so two things there. One, uh, the Raptors need to own up to being Canada's team, first and foremost. We're the only NBA team in, the N in Canada. We have 35 million people in our territory. We have the largest single territory in all of the NBA. And we're now gonna be Canada's team. And we're gonna take a lesson from the Blue Jays, who I think have done a good job of, of representing the country. And by the way, I think you're gonna see us stick to red. Uh, we, we are Canada's team, we're proud of that flag. Uh, your national anthem's a lot better than the old national anthem I used to have to sing. So I, we, we are very devoted to stepping up and representing this country. But most of all, whether it's merchandise people buy and wear, whether it's the brand, the 2.2 billion hits that we got with Drake, it's about winning. And until we win, no, people are gonna be ashamed to wear our jersey, our colors, our logo, and we know that. So Drake is, we're, we're doing this all together in one shot, whether it be the all-Star Game in 2016, a new image, logo, and design for our uniforms and our look, and a team that we think that could compete for a championship. We're, it doesn't take you long to figure out. We're on a mission so that 1516 is the year we can suddenly compete for a championship here and begin a dynasty of great basketball. And I think if we get there in that year with the All-Star Game, with our 20th anniversary, with Drake and his whole new line and branding that he's gonna do for our club, and with an opportunity for Masai to fix this club and get us to a point where we can win games. I think you're gonna see a three-year mission statement here, and then I'll bet you there's a lot of people that are gonna be wearing our logo and our jersey because they're gonna be proud of Canada's team. With that, again, we were honored to be a part of this today. I hope that we brought uh, some additional thinking to this great organization. And we, again, will look forward to being a great representation of this tremendous community. Thank you. We could have used Drake for our national anthem this uh, afternoon. 
I'd like to call Mr. Paul Foglin to say the appreciation. Thanks, uh, thanks, Noble, and thanks, Tim. Um, I'm a new uh, director here at the Empire Club of Canada, and uh, early on I found out that we have a tradition that uh, each member is expected to bring at least one speaker uh, each year to address the club. Um, my choice was obvious. Um, I've been an avid Toronto sports fan and a very loyal Raptors fan in particular through thick and thin. And uh, earlier this year when I heard the news that uh, Tim was coming up here from LA to take the reins of MLSE and to uh, bring his winning formula to a, to a city that desperately needs a winning team. Um, uh, I was very excited. And I think it's early in the, it's early in the hockey season, but um, I think the results are already starting to show. We have uh, one of the best teams in hockey, which we can all... We have, a, uh, we have a Raptors team that exceeded expectations in preseason. And there's a, there's a pervading sense of optimism, I think, in the city about uh, uh, the possibilities that we can have a winning winning franchises here in Toronto. Um, and make no mistake, sport is a big deal uh, here in Toronto, and for good reason. Like my colleague uh, Noble said earlier, sport um, is more than just business, and it's more than just entertainment. It, uh, it provides a sense of, um, of unity for a city, and a reason for people to uh, rally together. And I think particularly in a time where we tend to focus on what we disagree about, um, it's really important more than ever to have something we can rally behind. So on behalf of the Empire Club, I'd really like to thank uh, Mr. Laiwecki for coming and sharing a bit of his vision. And as a token of our appreciation on behalf of the board, we'd like to present to you this book. It's called Who Said That? Memorable Notes, Quotes, and Anecdotes, a selection of 100 years of the Empire Club. I didn't do anything to get in here today, did I? <laughs> Every word that's spoken at the club gets printed in a book and sent around the world to every embassy in, in the world and every library in Canada. And just for the record, he did say that he is definitely promising us a championship. So that, <laughs> that is in writing. Um, at your tables, you have uh, our upcoming events. We have Minister Charles Souza this Monday on November, uh, November 4th in this room at the Arcadian Court. And on November 5th, we have Linda Hassenfratt, CEO of Linamar Corporation at the Royal York Hotel. I'd like to thank Bruce Power for sponsoring our event this afternoon, BTA Advertising uh, for sponsoring our student table, Loretta Rogers Chair and Ryerson's RTA program in sport media for sponsoring our VIP reception. I'd like to also particularly identify a distinguished visiting professor, uh, Lean, one of my mentors from the Ryerson University who's here as well. Thank you uh, to the National Post as our print, me uh, print media sponsor. Thank you to Van Valkenburg uh, for providing our AV. This meeting will be carried and aired live on Rogers uh, TV. We are very grateful for your ongoing support. We're on Twitter and on Facebook, and we have our website where membership uh, information is available. It's empireclub.org. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again soon. This meeting of the Empire Club of Canada is now adjourned. <laughs>